All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abeljabar. What's up, man? How's uh, day? I don't even 347, know. Three hundred and forty-seven. I feel like three hundred and forty something. Yeah. Um, all the days are blending into each other right now, so I have yeah. zero clue how many days uh, we've been living under these circumstances. Yeah, I but... mean they've been blending together so hard. We're a day late on the fucking podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's completely blended in with each other. Um. But yeah, how are things? How are things? Uh, holding up. Uh, thankful that uh, you know I, I still have work and you know I get to be busy during the day. I can only imagine, and I empathize with all the folks out there that are just sitting at home, you know, going through their third iteration of uh, Friends, you know, or whatever streaming shit that they're watching <laughs> these days. The Tiger King, I don't know, all that did, shit. <laughs> did you watch Tiger King yet? I watched the first episode. It was interesting. It gets better. The first episode is just a it's just a peep show compared to what happens in the rest of the series. It's really it's very interesting. I mean, I heard bits and pieces of the podcast that came out before the show, um, so I definitely want to watch it. But you know, I, I swear, if somebody else recommends the fucking Tiger King podcast, to I me, know. <laughs> you know, like, I I totally get that because about fifty people. I started watching it before anyone else recommended it to me, so mm-hmm. I don't I don't have that angst towards it, mm-hmm. like. Um, I watched Don't Fuck with Cats. Oh, I did too, and holy shit! And oh man, it was kind of fun. It was kind of uh, it was it was really good, but it was kind of goofy at the same time. Like yeah. to think of all these dorks on the internet going yeah. on and investigating this, yeah, which I find kind of funny at the same yeah. time. But um, Tiger Kings was like recommended and started playing right afterwards. So I, I was like, okay, this looks lighthearted. He's nope. just a, this this crazy <laughs> gay redneck polygamist is uh is playing with some cats this seems pretty lighthearted, and then it eventually dives into something much darker but um mm-hmm. i do understand that um your resentment towards a show that everyone recommends to you i i typically will will do the same thing yeah seriously and it's it seems like you know nowadays you know obviously when something goes viral on netflix or one of the streaming services everybody's talking about it and you know if you haven't watched it yet, you might start getting annoyed by all the people telling Free you to watch Joe. it. Free you Joe! Know? Yeah. So it's like, it's that, but it's like magnified with coronavirus because like literally <laughs> millions of people have nothing better to do but watch shit, you know? So, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what people are doing with their spare time. Let us know. We'd be, we'd be interested. Yeah, actually, don't let us know. <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've, I've started bird watching. Bird watching? Bird like pi- watching. Pigeons? No, man. You go to Central Park, the oasis of Manhattan, you mm-hmm. can see a lot of stuff. I saw a dove the other day in Bushwick. Oh, a dove. Yeah. So he, he, called, he called himself Dove? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, I go to Central Park, and I'll just go and i'll just like walk around like a hobo for like an hour and a half almost every day just to get out and um the other day i'm like central park's pretty big you know yeah, what i mean huge. it's pretty yeah. break and it's pretty dense there's a lot mm-hmm. of there's a lot of like paths and shit inside the park and there's a surprising amount of wildlife in there yep not like deer but um there's like the mandarin duck yeah there's there's the mandarin <laughs> duck that ended up there somehow Someone probably released this mandarin duck, but everyone was going wild over this mandarin duck that's only native in Eastern Asia. Uh, it appeared on, like, 60th Street in Manhattan, and all these uh, duck enthusiasts and photographers were were uh, following this duck around for months, for months. And it was all over social media, and there was articles written about this duck. And uh, finally, I went to go see it. And the duck was pretty fascinating. The best part of it, though, was just watching all these people, like, so fascinated with this duck. As soon as it went close to them, as it started, like, you know, going or swimming towards, uh, I guess, the a little dock in the in the pond it was in, everyone starts going, like, shh, 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 no, no, no don't scare it away, don't scare it away. <laughs> um, and, but there was crowds of people watching this duck. Uh, what I was doing the other day, I was, like, walking around, and I was like, I saw a cardinal, which is not like a very common appearance in the park. So I was like, right. oh, I'm going to take a picture of this par- this cardinal. And I think I'm going to go take a picture of every single bird that's in Central Park. 
like every species of bird in Central Park. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing with my time. I'm bird watching. Nice. Um, the other day I ran into a raccoon. Oh, really? Yeah. It was only like 6.30 too. Huh. I don't know if that's a sign that it's uh, rapid or something or with rabies. No, I think it's just a sign of the fact that everyone's indoors now and nature is reclaiming its position on, on the world. Have oh, you heard that? Uh, interesting. Have you heard that? Um, I don't know if I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but like one interesting like silver lining to this whole pandemic is that uh, NASA has been recording you know, the levels of CO2 over like countries on lockdown and it's like dropping drastically in Venice. Uh, the waters are becoming cleaner and they've seen like dolphins and shit like outside of it. Um, and like, you know, fish and like wildlife are coming back. So I think the raccoons are just like, like confused. They're like, wait, shouldn't there be people out? <laughs> Let's go out and find some food. <laughs> v- Venice is smelling less like piss than it yeah. normally does. <laughs> I, 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 I guess, you know. It's a big toilet. Um, Venice is gross. Um, yeah, I saw a raccoon. But then Central Park is pretty gross, too, because I'm walking. I'm amazed by all this nature. There's less people. And then I and I walk up this path. And, of course, I walk into, like, a syringe and stuff. Like, not, I don't walk <laughs> into a syringe, but I w- see a syringe on the ground. And I'm like, that really just took everything away. All the peace I had in my mind all just went outside the window after seeing that. A little bit of context for your, like, uh, you know, walk, stroll through the park, your fantasy yeah. woodland, you know. Right. I just saw Ricky the raccoon and, and uh, Charlie the cardinal, and now I just bumped into you know, a junkie's, uh, <laughs> a junkie's, uh, needle. A junkie's <laughs> aftermath from two hours ago. No, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, let's get into the actual uh, topics of today. So. I guess the plan is to uh, talk about things that have been going on um, that are not directly related to coronavirus. A lot of these things have been skipped over the news. Um, not that these things would probably be reported regardless, but I-, I wanted to actually highlight something that I found pretty interesting, and I wish we tackled this last episode, but um, shit's going down in Africa right now, yep, yep, as, yep. as um, th- to say the least, and... Essentially, what's going on is that Boko Haram is uh, is uh, killing a lot of uh, killing a lot of people, and what they did about a week ago on March twenty third, Boko Haram ambushed a Chadian military encampment by the Lake Chad region, and the Lake Chad is is a freshwater lake and it borders Chad, Cameroon, Nigeria, and Niger. 92 soldiers were killed in a, in a seven hour firefight. And it ended up being one of the deadliest attacks in, in Chadian military history. Now, in addition to that, Boko Haram killed 50 Nigerian soldiers the next day. Right. And a place um, in Nigeria, but it's located all this is, this is a borderland, you know, right. All, you know, all the, around the, the Chad Lake area. And um, they killed 50 soldiers so in, in a span of about two days, or I think it was a 24-hour span, it might have been a little bit more than that, they killed 150 soldiers. That's a pretty huge deal. In, that's massive. In that, in that context. Um, yeah, that's massive. If, if that were to happen in Yemen, if that were to happen in Syria, if that were to happen anywhere in Iraq, um, that would be considered a pivotal battle. And um, so when you see casualties that high, they don't, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty alarming. And it's just one of those things that have gone that has really gone completely under the radar. I don't think most people have heard about that. I don't think most people know where where most of these countries are. To be completely honest, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, what I find really interesting, just to underscore, you know, this death toll. You know, Chad isn't necessarily like a big country that a lot of people are aware of, um, but Chad's not like a pushover state. They they happen to be a pretty big ally, you know, to the West in general specifically France, but, um, you know, France has, you know, major operating bases in Chad where they do their, um, campaigns in Africa to fight, you know, terrorists and shit. Um, but you know, they're supplied by Western militaries, you know, the U S specifically, you know, they've got our shit, you know, they have our tech and, you know, this one, um, facility, uh, was heavily fortified, right. And it was in, 
It was like kind of like an island, right? And the way that these guys snuck up on them, which is exactly what they did, they snuck up on them, is they took their boats and they and they they sent them over, you know, in the morning. I think it was like five in the morning or something like that when they attacked. And they put you know their boats on on just cruise, so they shut off the engines, and they came over real silently, almost like you know uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware kind of. Um, and they basically cut off their exit points, you know, um, and then just lit them up. And the crazy part about this is that, you know, it's not just, hey, they killed a bunch of people, but now they also got their hands on a ton of tech, a ton of mili- Western military tech. And this is very, very surprising because up until very recently, I think as recently as like uh, January or so, like they were getting their Boko Haram was getting spanked by, by chatty and warfighters, you know. Um, so this, you know, marks a, a huge escalation, uh, in there, a kind of almost a turning point in the war. And, you know, the way that they did it, you know, it's ironic because Chad, I mean, we've done an episode on this, you know, the president of Chad is Idris Debi Itno, uh, and he's particularly famous uh for you know pioneering the toyota war uh uh, against libya you know and um you know in that uh instance if you haven't listened to our episode on that i highly recommend it it's super interesting but you know the tldr for it was you know chad and libya are getting into a a spat on a border territory and uh chad was you know the underdog in this situation and they basically rigged up a bunch of toyota trucks with like machine guns on the back drove through the canyons and absolutely wiped the floor uh, with the Libyans. And that's kind of what Boko Haram did to Chad. You know, they got on some boats, used whatever military stuff that they have, you know, whatever weapons and armaments, which in fairness was not as good as the Chadians. And through the use of asymmetric warfare, were able to overtake this position and just wreck them. Yeah, well, it was a a turkey shoot. Yep. So they're shooting. They got him. They had him trapped, and they started shooting in both directions. And they really had no place to go or retreat. Right. Um. And then just you know think about that with the smoke going up in the air and ammunition blowing up and all that, and it's uh it's pretty deadly. Um. It was like what the highway of death in the yep. Iraq War. Mm-hmm. Um. That's um. It's. I think what like I was looking at the map of that base and it's like in a marshy area, so I would imagine it's pretty hard to if you get stuck there, you're you're pretty much fucked. And right on a borderland where it's Boko Haram could just get out of there. But apparently, if they were there for seven hours, you know they didn't leave because of reinforcements. They left when they wanted to leave. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I mean, I feel like it's like this is an interesting couple months you know a year for asymmetric warfare i mean not too long ago if you remember um the uh the folks down in (coughs) why am i why is this uh, eluding me here uh in saudi the saudi arabian brigades that got taken over um in yemen yemen yeah by the houthis right so just handful of these guys you know in sandals basically taking over two brigades of mostly mercenaries, admittedly, but armed with Western weapons. But a lot, I heard a lot of weapons are going, are seeping into Boko Haram from Syria now, hmm, which that's is probably true. That's what, that's what I heard. I don't, I haven't confirmed that at all, but I, I would imagine that is the case. Like a lot of, I mean, Boko Haram is ISIS, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, right. But it's just, just a, a different name. Yeah. They're just a Nigerian offshoot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, capturing girls and bartering them away like like auctions and taking ransoms and doing all that crazy stuff and yeah those um, guys are, are are disgusting yeah they're ter- terrible they're, people they're they're Monsters, they're terrorists really. they're terrorists there's rumors that the saudis fund them which i wouldn't be surprised um but yeah it's just another thing that's going on in the world that people are don't really care to talk about because yeah. let's just face it um i think people are pretty immune they're not immune to it, but they're numb to whenever they hear of a crisis in Africa, to be completely honest. I don't know if you feel the same way, but you hear, I think the general public, American public, they're just like, oh, it's, it's Africa. Like, that's really sad, but, you know, it's all the way in Africa. Right. Uh, kind of thing. It's very unfortunate, too, because, you know, 
uh, a lot of these things are, are products of, you know, I'm not going to say that we cause them, but, you know, Western countries exacerbate a lot of these issues, you know, um, Chad, uh, right now is in a really fucking tough spot. I mean, uh, you know, we, they're located in one of the most dangerous areas in the world right now in the North, they have Libya, which is in the middle of a civil war, you know, to the East, they have, uh, militias that control Darfur and the Sudan in the West, obviously Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. That's it's in the Northeast corner of Nigeria. Um, and, uh, you know, so they're kind of like they're landlocked, right? They don't have access to water. And a big portion of their economy is oil. And uh, if you've been following the news on, you know, uh, the prices of oil, that's been dropping steadily. I think we're hovering somewhere around $20 a barrel, which is crazy because I feel like with the last time we talked about this, when we were talking about Saudi Arabia and Russia getting into a fight about it, it was like, what, $56 or something like that? No, it was less than that. Last time we spoke about it, when we were talking about it, it was around thirty dollars a barrel. Mm-hmm. That was that's when the price of oil initially dropped. Really, 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 really. We we were talking about it when the when the price of oil uh, just initially had that huge fall, right? And it and it's still going down. Um, yeah, you know, uh, interesting point. You know, uh, Chad was in in a pretty bad depression uh, a while back uh, when the price of oil was around $36, right? So it being $20 right now is is obviously not great for them. Um, to give you context, uh, Chad is an oil exporter, but they're right. not a huge oil exporter. But that's where all their income comes from. You know? I think they're like number 40 in the world as far as oil exporters. So they're not a huge oil exporter, but still like, you know, governments like Chad, like Chad, first of all, is the size of fucking like half of Europe. Like right. all it's these massive. countries, mm-hmm. you ever... Mercator maps don't are you know they don't really do Africa yeah. justice about no. how large these countries are. Right. Um if you take the Congo for example and you compared it if you if you threw it in the United States or in North America it would stretch from southern Texas all the way to Canada. Mhm. It, it's, it's these big, countries it's a big country, yeah. These are humongous countries but that are scarcely populated with like so with Hundreds of ethnic groups with hundreds of ethnic le- groups and languages. And I think there's like 200 ethnic groups right now in, in Chad, right? Yeah. And, and the borders were never, the borders are drawn. They're just lines around re- resources. You know what I mean? They're not yeah, like totally. actual borders. Like African countries, they primarily speak French or English. You know, French and English are typically the national languages. I wouldn't say that. I, I mean, I, I would say that uh, they speak hundreds of regional yeah, dialects that's a but better way to com- phrase it but their common languages and specifically in chad would be things like english and french yeah that's that's a better way to put it like they they speak hundreds of languages but the common languages are you know the former colonial state languages english right. and and french but if you listen to like african news or something like that or it, when they have an expert on they're either speaking french or english you know um, it's like kind of like the educated language down there, but, um, it's like, it brings up the question, like, cause we never, we never really talk about, we don't talk about Africa too much on this podcast and we probably should talk about it more. But I think the, the question is like, why, why is Africa so impoverished? That's like a taboo question for a lot of people. Cause yeah. it's like, they jump to the conclusion. If you ask that question, you're like, Oh, are you going into like a race thing right there? Right. Which some people do. I don't really think it's a question of race at all. No, um, which, no I can say well, I can say with with absolute certainty it has nothing to do with race. I, I I agree with that. But regardless, there's this question. You know, there's if you listen to a lot of um, I guess you they call themselves race realist. Oh, no. race real? I am not racist. I'm just a race realist. Yeah, I think this is a load of horseshit. <laughs> uh, if we're if we're gonna be uh, real frank. Um, the reason, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's a single reason why, you know, a lot of these countries in, in Africa are impoverished, but I think there is uh, a, a common thread um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's corporatism, it's globalism, um, you know, so one thing to keep in mind is that pre-World War II, Africa was heavily colonized. Um, by a number of nations, mostly European. And, um, you know, in, in, in 
colonial in the colonialization of Africa. Uh, I, honestly, I wish we had uh, Danny Sherson on because you know this is like, you know, his cup of tea now. You know, in the colonialization of of of, uh, of Africa, the play was that they would import, you know, white European people into uh, you know the countries that they were occupying, and they would set up basically a class system where the indigenous peoples, the locals, were basically second class, and they you know served the the white classes, you know, if we're, if we're going to go racist, but let's, let's call, you know, let's call a spade a spade, you know, that's, that's the systems that they set up and they took advantage of their resources and they took advantage of the, you know, um, of the people, uh, you know, world war two happens. And then, you know, a lot of that just becomes undone. And a lot of countries decide to stop, uh, officially colonializing, uh, Africa. Now it took, you know, each, country longer to gain their independence you know from their previous um colonial uh overlords let's call them uh but you know they never really lost they never really got back to you know true sovereignty um and here's why rather than doing pure colonialism uh what now is happening is you know corporations are colo- are quasi colonializing these african nations and here's how they're doing it so let's say i am a you know dutch copper mining company right so i'll come in to a country like chad and whether through pressure or through bribery or you know whatever i gain access to you know, a copper mine, dirt cheap. And then uh, I mine the copper and I employ, you know, people from Chad at, you know, inhumane rates, you know, probably don't care very much about, you know, uh, OSHA (laughs) or like operational safety hazards, you know. Uh, We're doing it as cheap as possible to get as much as possible. And we take these natural resources and we ship them back to, you know, the Netherlands. To, and then, you know, at that point, now my company creates something out of this copper. And it's, in most cases, something that's needed or useful to the African country that I've uh, quasi-colonialized. And I'm going to sell it back to them at a pretty hefty markup. Um, and, you know, they're already not great on their GDP. And we're already taking a lot of their resources, so they can't you know, utilize their own resources uh, to have enough money. So they need money now to purchase the goods that they need from the resources that we took and created. And to make matters worse, in many cases, you know, the corporations will then set up some, you know, uh, some banks, some loans, right? And they'll loan the, the country some money at a very high, almost predatory rate, um, of interest and that kind of sets up a circle of debt that they can't get out of and so in order to satisfy that debt they try to lease out more of their land and give away more of their um, natural resources because they need money to pay their debts because they needed the goods that were being sold to them that were made from the products that uh, from the raw materials that they were leasing out in the first place you know um, and, you know, I guess it's, you know, when you look at it that way, it, it, it makes you think like, well, why did they do it in the first place? But, you know, it's, it's just corruption, you know, uh, and, and they never really had a great opportunity to establish, you know, themselves and set up their own economies independent of, you know, Western influence that was, frankly, uh, not in their interest. Yeah, um, I think you said that really well um, as far as how predatory loans and a lot of um, how there is a new form of uh, colonization that goes on in Africa that's not necessarily from a nation state, like physically putting a gun to their head, but through, you know, through the World Bank and the IMF and through 
um, you know, basically they export their their natural resources and they use in which they in turn uh, use that money to buy finished goods from their own natural resources. Correct. Right. Which is a recipe for complete disaster. Right. Like there's there's no way a country can become um, wealthy by by practicing those economic policies. It's a it's a it's a nexus between um, predatory lending, corruption within the government, because a lot of these government a lot of these governments are ran by despots. Right. Um, mm-hmm. For example, the president of Chad is a despot. Right. He is a polygamist who has multiple wives. He does so for political reasons too. You know, to yeah. try to get as many um, people on board with his agenda. Yeah, he's a polygamist with multiple wives. He's been around for like thirty years. Who's been or president like that. for thirty years? Yeah. Who has crackdowns on political opponents, and a lot of most of these African governments are incredibly corrupt. There, it, it takes it. It's almost like mind blowingly corrupt. Like Africa and, and the Middle East, like Iraq, are like the staples of very like Ukraine. Like a lot of countries in Eastern Europe too. Like Ukraine, super corrupt. Um, Iraq is very corrupt. Nigeria is incredibly corrupt. Um, you ever hear the story about the snake, how the snake ate all that money? No, tell me. So I just pulled it up while you were talking because I wanted to bring it up. So um, a, a million of dollars in Nigeria went missing, and the clerk responsible said the snake ate it. What? Yeah. Wh- what snake? Millions of dollars went missing. The snake ate it. Where did it go? The snake ate it. A snake? <laughs> the snake. The, the snake fuck? ate it. <laughs> you you really need to uh, look for those for that. You need to look hard for that that level of of corruption. But I mean, you could really just kind of pick any of them, um, and you'll find the same level of uh, just uh, of just salesmanship leaders. Because a lot of these leaders are are just are salesmen. You know, they're they're getting elected through just promising population something and really just taking all the money for themselves or 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 through political alliances or or uh ravaging hate for another eth- ravaging up hate for another ethnic group is a very popular one mm-hmm. using some type of ethnic nationalism right right and that's the condition in, in like ethnic nationalism typically so there's two types of nationalism that you typically see you know there's civic nationalism or i think a lot of scholars who study nationalism would probably kind of characterize it there, there's civic nationalism which we have in America, um, what you would find a lot in Western Europe, um, where there's a combination of all these ethnicities, you know, to be under, you know, to fly under the banner of the nation state, you know, whether that's America or France or England or, or really whatever. Uh, most nation states have some degree of like, you know, a, a, a look into their heritage, you know, like, you know, the U.S., a lot of people in the U.S., they look at their Anglican heritage or their British air heritage. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're all Americans. You know what I mean? Like, neither of us is more American than the other one. Right. You know, and you're <clears throat> um, Puerto Rican and, and Palestinian and I'm Irish and Polish. Right. You know, we're still we're the same American. level. We're still the same level of American regardless. Right. For Eastern Europe and Central Europe, especially during the 1800s. A different type of nationalism took place. It doesn't. It does. Does this is not all of it, but uh, like a form of ethnic nationalism, more so took place. Ethnic nationalism is usually you. You can tell when there's not, there's an ethnic nationalism when there's this story of the, when there's like a humiliation story, and when there's like pseudo heritage stories, like right. when they like tr- when when a country tr- when an ethnic group or a nation tries to trace back ethnic heritage to like a really really long point of time. Right. Like, oh, like the Germans, we can trace our heritage back to the Teutonic Knights who slayed dragons. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, the Middle East, the Middle East is very, there's a lot of ethnic nationalism go, that goes on in the Middle East. Um, and that goes on in Africa as well. And you really can't expect that process of civic nationalism to really ever take place. Because those borders were artificial borders that were drawn around resources by, you know, the, the former colonial powers rather than like legitimate states that formed. Um, again, Africa is hum- a humongous continent with these humongous uh, countries landwise that are bigger 
much bigger land wise than than all these European states, with loads of resources, with scattered populations that speak millions of languages. So that nation building process never really can really take place. And a lot of that is like, you know, the the race realist. Well, well, the reason why they weren't able to do that is because of the difference between IQ. You see, my ancestors, they were the children of the Enlightenment and built a steam engine, oh, which I think is dumb because it's such a dumb argument because the scientific capital moved around the world right. all throughout Many history. times over, yeah. Many yeah. times. Mm-hmm. So, like, now the scientific capital is in Asia. Right. You know, it's mm-hmm. it was in Baghdad during the 1200s. It was mm-hmm. in Egypt. It was in Alexandria. It, you know, at that time, people the people of Europe were essentially, like, raiding castles. And, and uh, you know, before that, they were still living in caves when these great civilizations in, in the Middle East and Persia were, were going about. Right. It moves around, man. It moves around. And, you know, to, to a point that you made earlier that I wanted to expose a little bit more is that, you know, what happens, uh, what's happening right now in a lot of these African countries, but this isn't limited to just African countries, you know, uh, a lot of places with corruption, this, you know, this applies where, you know, they'll utilize the uh, kind of very diverse sectarian divides within uh, the nation state um, to cause, you know, uh, uh, tension. Uh, and so when one despotic leader claims power, they'll pit multiple, you know, uh, uh, tribes or, or uh, ethnic, ethnic peoples against one another uh, so that they're fighting one another so that they can remain in power, you know. And uh, in, in this case, the president of Chad, as you mentioned before, has a ton of wives, you know. And part of the reason why he does is because, you know, if he marries the daughter of some, you know, tribal or ethnic leader, you know, then they form an alliance. You know, it's very Game of Thrones, you know. And, you know, if he gets enough of the good ones on his side, then, you know, he can rem- he can keep his power and remain that way. And so, you know, they utilize this process, you know, of you know, the nature of this, as you point out, very artificially drawn border, you know, and they use the fact that, you know, there is so much diversity in in culture and in ethnicity and in language uh, to their advantage. Um, and frankly, so does the rest of the world, right? Um, because there's no, as you point out, civic nationalism going on, you know, within these very um, uh, heterogeneous uh, countries. And by heterogeneous, I mean like m- multiple uh, tribes and, and sects, um, they're not able to really get together, uh, to find common ground and find, you know, um, uh, uh, common interest because they're pitted against one another purposefully. And, you know, one way, uh, and this is coming back to, you know, the reasons why, you know, some of these African countries are so poor and how it has to do with, uh, corporatism is, uh, you know, the military industrial complex. Uh, so, um, in this case, it's pretty easy, uh, to sell this group or that group, a bunch of arms. And then, you know, if you're an, you know, an investor, a hedge fund, right. That's investing in Raytheon or Boeing or, you know, Lockheed Martin, you know, these people that are creating the weapons, you know, it's in your interest that people start fighting each other. Right. Uh, because then they'll want to buy weapons, right? They'll have no choice. It's either buy them or die, you know. Uh, and, you know, the military industrial complex is, is happy to legitimately sell them weapons. Um, all they need is just a little bit of chaos. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different types of people, you know, uh, in sparsely populated areas, in a massive country with no strong civic nationalism, um, with despotic leaders that are more than willing to throw their people under the bus to make a buck, you know, so all of this kind of adds up to why it's very, very difficult to make, you know, a strong and prosperous economy, uh, in countries like these, especially, you know, they're, they're really writhing in pain from colonialism, from, you know, decades of colonialism. 
and a lot of this is because of um so there's two things um there's geography and i think geography is like the biggest point um yeah i, I would i would encourage people to read thomas soul on on this subject he is my favorite writer when it comes to why different countries or different areas have prospered a lot of it just has to do with the flat out flat out ge- geography like is a state close to the water is it landlocked is it close to rivers? Are there trading ports? That is, right. Those are the main factors when it comes to a successful um, state or con- country or um, or really what leads to good economic policy. Um, a big reason why a lot of these countries are poor is not just – I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons, and, and I think we nailed a couple of them. I, you know, the kind of the neocolonialism that does go on, uh, mostly in Europe right now. Uh, Europe is – Africa is Europe's playground more so than the U.S., and – um, you know, it's also China's middle, playground. Actually, yeah, too. It's China's didn't playground. Touch that, yeah, yeah. China, China, and uh, and, and Europe uh, use Africa as their kind of like their sandbox, and the U.S. uses Latin America and the Middle East as their sandbox. But um, a lot of it is just because of their own economic policies are are bad. Right. They don't have sound economic policies, and that's this is a pretty much a characteristic of most LCDs. Um, or excuse me, LDCs, um, like lower developed countries. Right. Um, they will typically either be their development policies are usually either centered around um, like agro export led growth, which many underdeveloped countries have a competitive competitive advantage in. Um, they'll have a competitive advantage in growing a particular crop, and. What ends up happening, though, is that the, the, the domestic market is really limited due to the poverty of the local population. Right. Therefore, development can only be achieved by producing and reinvesting profits into industry. And in the past, you know, reliance on agro exports were agro expo, exports was was really commonly associated with colonialism. So, like for example, like the cotton export to Europe was expanded during British colonial rule in Egypt and Sudan, while wine production was introduced to in North Africa, and um, the agro export strategy faced like a lot of problems, such as like declining terms of trade for 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 products and and, and just favoring certain classes and, and excessive taxation, and that's just like one of them, and that's just like one strategy that they'll they'll use. Um, also they'll use mineral export led growth and in the Middle East, for example, there's really not too many minerals and Africa. There's a lot of minerals. Um, yep. A whole lot of them. Have you heard of blood diamonds? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but the, the problem is, is that these are finite resources and in the in international prices, they change. Right. And they're affected uh, by so many different variables, right? So, you know, in, in, in the case of oil, as an example with Chad, right, Chad, you know, isn't, is like the 40th largest uh, exporter of oil. So not like the biggest by, by any stretch, but for them, oil is their cash crop, so to speak. And a pandemic like coronavirus now disrupts that, you know, global demand uh, for it. And, you know, suddenly you're fucked, you know, and if you're another LDC, another lower developed country, and you now grow wheat, but suddenly there's a plague of locusts that threatens to eat all your crops, which is, by the way, happening right now, um, you know, then, well, you're fucked, (laughs) you know, Uh, they're they're not particularly diversified um, economies. And, you know, in, in one way, you know, the, the, the critics of, of, you know, countries like these, you know, could point out that, well, why aren't they diversifying their economies? Well, it's, it's not just that simple, right? Uh, not everybody can spring up out of, you know, out of nowhere after being colonial, uh, colonialized, for, colonized, excuse me, for, um, you know, decades and decades can just spring up a Western style, super diverse economy uh, just at the drop of a hat, you know? That extreme measure, like Saudi Arabia and their strategy of oil development, mm-hmm. um, that only really works with a country like Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, mm-hmm. where they have such massive oil reserves that they're able to build up large reserves of wealth and and have that as savings for when the price of oil does eventually drop, because the price of oil will always drop and rise. 
and they there's a big difference between Saudi Arabia and Chad as far as exporting oil. Like right. one is Saudi Arabia is number one. It's very incredibly wealthy um, compared to Chad and most countries in Africa and the Middle East. And um, you know Chad is mainly impoverished. the The issue though with 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 Saudi Arabia is that their and this goes with all countries that are mineral export. You know they have mineral export led growth. Typically, that creates huge welfare systems. Mineral exporting it's a low, it's a highly capital capital intensive. It, it's Right, you need millions of dollars to set up a mine, as an example. Billions of dollars to set up a mine. It's billions of dollars and millions of dollars to set these up, and the labor machinery does all this, so it's not going to employ a large group of people. So there's really no incentive to develop human capital. So what happens is that in Saudi Arabia, for example, and this is something that's going to bite them in the ass in in the future, starting to bite them in the ass right now, is that they don't have... A very qualified workforce. Right. Um, they Saudi workers are known to be lazy. You know, it's you know they rather hire outside for a company in Saudi Arabia. And usually, when you create these welfare systems um, or these huge, um, yeah, let's just call them welfare systems. That's what, that's what they are. Like Saudi Arabia is a big welfare state. Um, but when you do that in a country with really high unemployment. Um, you're giving that power to a salesman dictator to really pick and choose who they, you know, b- based off the based off really a transaction that will keep them in power, uh, who they're going to distribute that wealth to. So that's another problem with these these uh these mineral export led led countries. Now there is a development strategy that has been used in the past in countries like Egypt and Turkey. And it worked to some degree, and essentially what it is, it's it's um, it, it's designed to move economies traditionally dependent on the export of primary commodities and raw materials to an industrial footing. Right. And new industries are expected to produce goods that were previously imported and uh, process their own domestic raw material. Correct. Um, like the result in theory would be economic diversification and it would reduce the dependency on volatile external markets for primary products right and that would start with you know it would be start with domestic products and and, and wage increases and it also increases and, the skill sets uh and um uh, of the workers themselves right because now that create that generates a demand for their for their own human capital yeah exactly Exactly, and and that's what Egypt did in the sixties, in early with Nasser when he first became, when he uh, took power, he um, he envisioned like this really massive textile sector using Egyptian cotton, and that would completely release foreign imports, and um, that would link back to investing into like uh, advanced machinery. So you know the profits they would get from the textile sector, they would then use that to um, invest in their, you know, their spinning and weaving machinery. Um, but the, here's the thing, though, that doesn't really work, though, because in order to do that, new industries need to be protected by foreign competition. Right. And this and the, ends up just creating monopolies in the sector, right. meaning a higher cost for similar imports and, and lower quality goods. Right. So, like, Import substituting industrialization. What that does, it just it just um, it it ends up being a form of cronyism at the end of the day. Absolutely, and because it think, relies on tariffs, and it relies and hundred percent. You're you're a hundred percent right. You know because you're going to need to you need a, a a good political climate to get some like an idea like this done. You know, and these you know. LDCs like Chad don't have a very good political climate that would be set up to not create cronyism and monopolies, right? Right now, and and frankly, you know, this isn't a, is strictly a internal issue. It's also external pressure that keeps it that way, right? It is in the interests of the corporations that go in to lease the 
the lands to take the resources to then create the goods and sell it back to the same country you know they have financial interests to make sure that uh that their operation stays in power and that um and that they don't you know get uh pushed out by you know uh internal uh industry right like like what we're describing like what uh nasser did in the 60s with egypt right um these companies are going to be investing heavily in the politicians in the leaders of those countries that are going to be favorable to their interests well we know what it also does though it also develops into regional scapegoating because the resource the public resources is typically not enough so they end up having to tax the agriculture sector for this and this ends up being turning into a regional scape zoning to rural populations mm -hmm. Which will further divide the country, right? In an already very divided, you know, situation. And and these industries are are too capital intensive to provide jobs to those rural workers. Um, so there's really no win for the agriculture sector. Yeah, it's 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 a damn shame. So you know, this is this is, and it's funny, Henry. I'm having a lot of fun talking about just like uh financial politics uh and and economic politics of africa you know i don't think we've ever touched this subject before uh, yeah i don't think we've ever talked about this before um it's, it's i, I kind interesting of interesting shit i yeah i don't i don't i wasn't we were not planning on talking about this whatsoever yeah it just kind of turned into that yeah um but yeah like the it's it's really hard to like what do you do like wh where do you start because all the development strategies that have really been used there's other ones as well there's there's man there's um growth led by agriculture development and that's really for poor country like really really impoverished countries that would be some a strategy that would be used in a country like yemen um yeah but where again agriculture development would be, is the only way yeah but that's to, that's also not foolproof because in yemen we covered this uh you know while we were covering covering the war in yemen there was a giant plague of locusts, <laughs> you know? Uh, so if you have an agriculture-based economy, right, and and what amounts to an act of God, or, you know, for the atheists out there, just a natural disaster, you know, uh, it, it completely disrupts it, right? So, you know, in order to grow crops, you need the correct conditions. If there's a drought, you're fucked. If there's a plague of locusts, you're fucked. Um and if there's geopolitical issues like a war, you're fucked, you know? And if you're like Chad and you're landlocked and you can't necessarily export things, you're also fucked. You know, so it's it's a good idea for some, but it doesn't work for all. Well, there's a big problem with manufact with so there you can you can um try to develop growth by increasing your manufactured exports, but that ends up not being a politically convenient tool for a despot because it requires the reduction of tariffs and it also devaluates um it, it, the devaluation will cause prices to skyrocket for the urban consumer so and that's not a very popular <laughs> you know yeah position it's, it's not have. it's not very pot it's not really popular the cost of so, bread goes up everyone's gonna riot you know so that's kind of what you're dealing with right and a lot of just these, this really these apply to like not just africa but to any LDC, most really yeah. most countries that are developing right now there's mm -hmm. a nexus between just economic quagmires because the, the right economic decisions that you know they probably should make are not politically popular then there is the there's also you know there's foreign wars as well which right. It's another thing. It's not as much in Africa as it is in the Middle East, but there's still that avenue. And then there's predatory lending with corruption. It's just a whole nexus of all these things. And right, uh, it's tough. So what, what I don't, I I don't. What do you say? What do you What do you do? I, yeah, I was going to say that, but like, what have we learned in the last forty minutes of talking about you know African economic policy? And I think it's you know, 
undoubtedly has nothing to do with race and has nothing to do with like this bullshit IQ nonsense, right? Hopefully you've learned a couple of things by, you know, hearing us out on this. <laughs> well, the reason why it's so it's such a dumb argument is because, all right, why don't you, why don't we apply that same logic to North and South Korea? Mm -hmm. So one country is awesome. Like it has one of the largest economies in the world. Right. South Korea is ninth largest economy in the world. Yeah. I'm just, I think it's nine or so. It's up there. It's it's very high up there. They're making cell phones. They're making computers. They're making weird music videos. And North Korea, it's pitch black at night. Like <laughs> yeah. the craziest picture that you can see that like shows. The satellite photos? The satellite picture of South Korea and North Korea. South Korea is vibrant and there's lights and there's civilization. And North Korea is completely darked out. It's like a bunch because, of nothing. Mm -hmm. Because one country practices sound economic principles south korea did have their really bad times of course Let's just they had their really bad times in in the 60s and 70s but they eventually rose out of it you know there was a shitload of corruption that was in taking place in the government they were not always south korea of today right. well, they're and also north korea ravaged by war too so <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> nor in north korea was doing doing you know well compared to how they're doing now is because they were receiving so uh, they were receiving a lot of foreign aid from the Soviet Union at the time. Mm -hmm. But now North Korea is a communist fascist hellhole and South Korea is, is great in world standards. Yep, they're awesome. They're the exact same race. Right. Same, with the exact same, same IQ levels. <laughs> yeah. Same it's people. all it everything has to do with the economic policies that have taken place and, and like what the governments that have been in charge and whether they were internal, incredible. external yeah. factors, you know. Yeah. Uh, Fuck that. So it's it's like I just don't get these these uh these race arguments. Like I've never been a fan of it. And you know, a lot of these people who do it, it's like these uh these these losers, these kids who are like, Oh, my ancestor uh, you know, he my ancestor's skin color was the same as the guy who made the cotton gin. Or the guy who made the steam engine. Therefore, I'm entitled to all this praise. <laughs> like, what? You know, it's funny. Where, where did that like entitlement a, come from? If they took, like, a DNA test, like, a, a bunch of them might end up, you know, surprised at how many different races they're represented by. But that's a different topic. Well, the thing about Europeans is that Europe has been invaded so many times. Mm -hmm. That is very, very diverse. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't even really know what it is. Right. It, it's... We need to do a podcast on the rise of the nation state because I think that's an important thing to to really cover. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to talk about it earlier, I but mean, we talked I think about I, it a little bit during Thirty Years War. You know, right at the yeah. end, we talked about it a little bit with the French Revolution. You know, but yeah, maybe we can do an, uh, kind of an overview there. The rise the rise of the nation state would be an interesting an interesting podcast because I think there's a lot of. Um, I don't want to say wrong information, but a lot of people don't think about what a nation is, like what the nation state is and mm -hmm. like the process that it took to form a nation. Because I said this in the 30 year war podcast that if you took somebody from the 1500s or the 1600s, you put them in a time machine and you brought them to the United Nations, they would be like, what the hell is the United Nations? Like what's a nation? They wouldn't know what a nation was right? because back in the day, they were more they were more loyal to their tribal or village heritage rather than to the state right or monarchic, and right mm -hmm. these nation states didn't really start rising until the 17 and 1800s like there wasn't these mass education movements where everyone was speaking the same language and there was this like national heritage type thing going on that um that trace their roots back to like the, like the bourbons and stuff like that. Like those were what ended up really happening is that like in France and, and uh, England and these like capital urban cities, the intellectual class used the, the, uh, you know, the language spoken in these urban centers and they try, they, they kind of spread that out to the rest of the country and, to form a national identity mm -hmm. and what it took, it took 
massive amounts of propaganda to do it. Like in reality, that's what it was. It took mass, like these, these stories of national identity in, in these, like, you know, these historians writing about some type of culture unity to unify, you know, village a, where they speak, you know, one language and, in village B where they speak another language. Like there was a process that wasn't natural that had to take place. That was completely artificial that took place. And this happened in Europe in the 1800s. Um, it hasn't really happened in Africa. Like that's, that's, that's like kind of really what it comes down to. And it's a lot harder to go down in Africa because Africa, African countries are way bigger and they're more diverse and they're sparsely populated. They don't have those rivers, those natural rivers to connect everyone together. So it's just a combination of like so many different things. But um, if you're debating the race and IQ thing, I, I just I think the best example, I think North and South Korea is, is like the greatest example to to test that, you know, the kind of debunk that one race is smarter than another race. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so let's dive into that into another show later on. I think that would be a really interesting topic to, to like really hit. I'm actually reading a couple of interesting books on it. That's why I've kind of been like thinking about this type of stuff lately. Um, one of the books you actually sent to me, yep. which I will not name on, on name on the show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I wanted to talk about, I wrote down some, like some, some uh, strange you shared some stories too, about some w- kind of weirder news that's been going on. That's, that's. For kind of related to to COVID nineteen, um, you know, I wanted to we we both wanted to go as as far as possible without talking about COVID as the main crux of the podcast. But you know, it's such a huge thing; it obviously requires attention. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk about some weird stuff that's going on. All right, where should we start? Let's, let's see. Where's my freaking? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong Google sheet. You start. I got to pull up my notes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the one that uh, I found super interesting uh, was the news about the, uh, you know, USS Theodore Roosevelt, the, you know, nuclear powered super carrier, and how uh, they got a bit of spat of um, coronavirus there. <laughs> uh, did you hear about this news? Yeah, you sent me the article. That's very. So, what exactly happened? So, the. the... The commanding officer? Yeah, so we'll get to the commanding officer in a second. So the, the, the setup for this is that, you know, something like 100 people got infected um, on this ship. And uh, I found this super interesting because we talked um, at length uh, months ago about supercarriers. And, uh, you know, to give a quick TLDR, these things are floating islands, right? Like they house 5,000 airmen hundreds of airplanes and other military equipment more guns than you can think of and they roll deep with you know support ships and things like that um and this particular vessel uh was i think stationed in vietnam uh just before uh they started getting their first um outbreak of coronavirus uh and you know the thing about that is maybe they got it from vietnam uh but also, it's pretty hard to track how they did it because they have, you know, uh, aircraft coming on and off of this ship regularly to resupply, change out, you know, um, uh, uh, semen, um, all kinds of shit, right? So it could have came from anywhere. Semen. <laughs> semen. <laughs> um, but for real, like, it, it could have came from anywhere. So, like, trying to figure out exactly where it came from is almost like a futile exercise. The point, though, is that a, an aircraft carrier is like, It's like New York City, right? It is super densely populated, super close quarters. You know, we're talking about hallways that are like maybe five feet wide. We're talking about in order to, you know, man certain aspects of, uh, you know, the the ship, you are literally right on top of one another. You know, we got people sleeping in bunks, you know, thousands of people sleeping on bunks, you know. Uh, dozens in, in, in particular rooms, uh, you know, people sharing bathrooms and showers and all kinds of stuff, plenty of surfaces, uh, and the damn ship is made of, like, steel, so, like, you know, uh, if you've been reading about, like, what surfaces, you know, COVID-19 can survive on, 
you know, uh, those like nice smooth ones are, are pretty, pretty conducive for the virus, you know, so it became a problem really, really fast. Right. And, and also it's a particularly big problem because this is like several billion dollar, you know, uh, ship with even more billions of dollars of equipment on it. Um, and, it is the you know military might of the United States, which is by and large the most powerful in the world, and suddenly it's it's at risk of getting you know being incapacitated because of the coronavirus, right? So like coronavirus does not discriminate. You know we might have the best guns, but can't do shit against the virus, and so that's kind of the setup of this, right? It, it's becoming a clusterfuck, and you know the commander of the ship. Uh, Captain Brett Crozier, he wrote uh, what many people will probably uh, describe as a scathing uh, report to his superiors. Uh, and, you know, he wrote that we need to do something about this shit. And I'm trying to pull up this quote because it was it's pretty strong. Um all right, I can see the quote from here, but it's not like the full, this is good enough. All right. Um, all right, so Brett Crozier, uh, he wrote to his superiors, and this is a part of the quote. He says, we're not at war. Sailors do not need to die. Uh, and this was, you know, his plea to his commanders to, you know, do more uh, and to basically evacuate the ship, you know, cleanse it down. Um, so that they can get back to operating uh, uh, capability. Um, and, you know, he was very recently, the news today is that he was relieved of his command. Uh, and it raises a bunch of eyebrows. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously this guy, Brett Crozier, he was... He, I mean, I don't yeah, know... Yeah, wrong thing. Yeah, I, I, I have no idea how else to put this, like... What else do you do when your massive floating ship that's super conducive to spreading contagion is exhibiting signs of a spread of a, a virus that is very deadly? You know, like he was so right. He was he was so right, and he nailed it so hard that they had no choice but to relieve him from duty because it would be an embarrassment to keep him on board, knowing that he said something that was so strikingly true, <laughs> like. <laughs> You know, uh, like, now, isn't this kind of dumb that uh, we are we're sailing around the world right now in a big <laughs> virus infected ship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so they're like, hmm, the guy's got a point. Fire that man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, like, OK, so people on one side are saying that this is like whistleblower retaliation. And it, it certainly sounds like that. But the bullshit reason that. I think it's bullshit, but the bullshit reason that, uh, you know, the Pentagon is saying is that uh, they let him go to poor, due to poor, extreme, quote, extremely poor judgment, right? Um, why? Uh, and I guess this might be fair criticism, uh, but I don't know if this is extremely poor judgment. The dude CC'd on this email something like 30 people, you know, 30 people who I assume are you know, his superiors or people related to his superiors, like people that needed to know. And I think that the, the, the judgment, the extremely poor judgment here was that he should have sent this to fewer people so that it wouldn't get leaked. Now, so far, everyone, you know, on the uh, military side is saying that, you know, uh, uh, we don't, think that Crozier leaked it himself. Like, that's that's not a question, I think. What I think they are trying to make the case for is that he should have limited the number of people that he sent this this uh, message to, um, and that would have reduced the, you know, uh, risk of it being leaked to the public, and, you know, that caused a firestorm and, like, a lot of blowback, and, you know, basically he caused trouble, you know, for them. And so that was extremely poor judgment. But like, dude, in his defense, he thought his sailors were going to die for something that's totally preventable. You know? No, it makes it makes uh, it's common sense. I don't know if he thought all of the sailors were going to die. Well, 
even if some of his sailors die, that is unacceptable. And even more importantly, even if some of them die and more of them are sick, then that disrupts the operations of the ship, right? We're talking about, again, billions of dollars of ship, even more billions of dollars of equipment, and a pivotal point, one of 11, a pivotal point in the U.S. military. Can you imagine if, like, I don't know, all of the, you know, or or a good percentage of the people who operate the United States's, you know, nuclear uh, weapons capability couldn't do their job? Or even more importantly, what if the U.S.'s air traffic control, <laughs> you know, all became sick or some large percentage of them became sick, which, you know, was to the detriment of, of air traffic all over? You know, like, this is... He was right, in my opinion. This was 100% the right move. And the military are mad that the, the press found out about it and they and they got all embarrassed about it. And they didn't like it. So they, they canned him. They shit canned him. I, I think it sounds like he got fired because he made someone look stupid. Yep. You know? Yep. I think that's, that's, that's what it sounds like to me mm-hmm. based off the emailing drama and stuff like that. Right. And, you know how things go, like, uh oh, you CC'd the wrong person on that email. <laughs> you said <something laughs> but her emails to, though, <laughs> but but over but her email, but um, it sounds like, you know, from where you and I are sitting, it sounds something, it sounds perfectly reasonable, but you know the politics that's going on within the rank and file, I guess it's a different story. You don't know who you don't know whose shoes he stepped on. At least thirty of them, I guess, right? <laughs> Some all it took was probably one. Yeah, <laughs> the wrong, the one wrong person. Yeah, yeah, totally. But I mean, now the the ship is stationed in Guam. I think they removed like a thousand of the five thousand. Um, I also think that you know, in in fairness, uh, what he was proposing was pretty extreme. Um, he was uh, suggesting that they leave kind of a skeleton crew of five hundred people on board the ship, and um, based on what I'm reading here it would probably take more than 500 people to, you know, maintain the ship. But you got to remember this thing is nuclear powered, right? You don't want to let this thing sit by itself, you know, um, requires. It sounds like the beginning movies. of a Tom Clancy novel. Seriously. Nuclear powered shit. Seriously. You know, so, skeleton crew, but that's when <laughs> Somalian pirates take it over. No, more like it'd be like Russian operatives loyal to Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Trying to bring back the Soviet, the communist government by stealing a nuclear-powered <laughs> aircraft carrier that was Metal Gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it does sound like a tell. I swear I don't have Corona. <clears throat> or do I? Who knows? Uh, I am in New York. Um, yeah, that sounds like Metal Gear. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting story. But- one of the Metal Gears took place in a in a aircraft carrier, right? I think so. I didn't play them all, so possibly. Oh, I love I love Metal Gear. It's one of my guilty pleasures. I used to love watching people play Metal Gear. Like my my brother had it. Um, I think it was like Metal Gear Three, and I didn't even play it. That's I, the best. I just like watched Metal, it. Metal Gear Solid Three, the third one. Yeah. When he's I think he's in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I don't think they actually named the country he's in, but it's supposed to be Vietnam. Um. It's Snake's father, mm-hmm. who's this clone. It's so funny because it's exactly what I would expect from, like, a Japanese, um, like, uh, a really creative Japanese, like, uh, storyteller <laughs> Yeah, on their take on American, like, you know, the, the American military industrial complex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, it's... it's the game Just plays so like a bizarre. manga, you know? Yeah, <laughs> if you, you took the Japanese perspective and you made them just, like, make the most ridiculous story in the world and you did it on, like, a Tom Clancy novel, that's what you have. That's what you get with Metal Gear. The stories are ridiculously weird, yep. but they're also kind of interesting at the same time. Yeah, totally. But they're filled with, like, the really cheesy dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's, so, yeah. it's such a weird thing that you have to... I love it. Fun game. Man. Metal Gear! Fun game. I don't have a He's PlayStation, a otherwise I might pick it up. Maybe I'll emulate it or something. Who knows? Do you have a GameCube? No. No. Do you have a Wii? I got a Switch. 
they don't have the old they made a remake of the first of uh metal gear solid on gamecube i had that one i mean i got a ps2 emulator on my phone so maybe i'll just pick up a copy um whatever it should it would be a fun a fun thing to play yeah metal gear um what's the it's like the end of metal gear the end of metal gear solid uh, there's always like a recap at the end where the bad guys are like are speaking over the phone mm-hmm. yeah. about like that about the, and like the first Metal Gear Solid it ends with um with uh the president being a bad guy he's like <laughs> yeah. dude you wish Mr. President and that's like the end, big twist <laughs> it's <laughs> it's so it's so funny um yeah that is that is interesting so all right. You want to move on to the next story? Yeah, yeah. All right, this is a fun. This is a funny one. Um, so Benjamin Netanyahu, the uh, I guess the current dictator of Israel. <laughs> oh, that, man. Does, he, does he have Does he have that I, title yet? I don't know. He, did, he, did he take that title yet? I don't know. Um, because once coronavirus hit, he's like, "Oh, I need to take all the power. No more, no more elections. No more court. Uh, courts are closed. Everything's closed. I, I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm." For everyone's safety, <laughs> uh, he's the most shameless politician on earth. One of he, one of the most shameless politicians on earth. Where to point? We were just like, I kind of respect it. <laughs> he's so he's so brazen. He's also enormously popular in Israel, but um, he shared a fake video. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's. I'll peel this back. So he was um, – he claimed that he had evidence that Iran was covering up coronavirus deaths. <laughs> and the evidence was from a Hallmark series <laughs> called Pandemic. Oh, man. You can't make this shit up. It's hilarious. <laughs> oh, man. We got to link speechless. that in the notes or something like that. That's hilarious. You see, Iran is covering up this. Look at this footage. <laughs> the foot, look at look at the, 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 the reporting. <laughs> it's uh, Mister Mister Netanyahu. Uh, that is from the film Jurassic Park. <laughs> 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 you see, Iran has done, look. They're breeding these these creatures. Oh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the colossal raptor. They are six months away from <laughs> the Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> uh god i just thought that was hilarious yeah all right other world or other world leaders that are taking uh, power <laughs> the, the president of chechnya ramzan kadryov this happened like a week ago he said this but he says anyone who breaks coronavirus quarantine should be executed <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's fucked up that we're laughing at it but jesus uh He's a, that guy's crazy. Yeah, he's a nut bell. He's you ever see a picture of him? No, actually. Let me let me I've only read He looks like Jamie Lannister. He, he looks like Jamie Lannister uh went to Syria to fight in Idlib. Okay. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> just click on it. Hold on, I'm gonna Google his name just so I can see. Just go Google image. Ramzan R A M Z A N Space. Just president of Chechnya. Yeah. <laughs> and Jamie Lannister went to go fight in Idlib. Yeah, dude, you're totally right. Yeah. There's a lot of crazy ass stories about this guy, too, because, like, I've. I, we can go down a rabbit hole with this shit. Uh, we should probably talk about him at a certain juncture because, holy shit, this guy. He's a. He was a. Kind of a dual fighter in the Chechen War. Mm-hmm. Like the first Chechen War, he was anti Moscow, and then the second one, he was pro Moscow. Right. But his father ended up getting killed on from the pro when he was on. They both defected to the pro Moscow side, and his father ended up getting killed while on the Moscow side. It's kind of an interesting story, but he he double crossed the uh, the the resistance to Russia. Um, isn't he also but like super buddy buddy with Putin now? Yeah, he used to be anti Putin. Now he's pro Putin. Yeah. Um. But he's he's a very interesting interesting uh, character. All right. 
Uh, also, the the, pre- the president of the Philippines said that as well. Yeah, I mean, D- uh, Duterte or whatever his name is, right? Yeah, Rodrigo Duterte. D- Duterte. He's like, yeah, he's like, he's another fucking there, character. Man. There were people protesting, and he was, he was like, just ex- just kill them all. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's he's very hardcore. Uh, but I guess it makes sense because you know, Philippines is is a uh, is a series of like forty thousand islands. Yeah. I guess you got to roll that place with an iron fist. Uh, I don't know. I disagree with that. I, no, I don't agree with his crap <laughs> yeah. with killing protesters. I'm just saying it makes logical sense that he would be a nut, especially because in East Asia, you know, they're right there in like prime jihad areas because that's like a hot spot for for Islamic terrorism. Right. That, that entire circle of like Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, in the Philippines, there's a lot of lot of like extreme um, Islamic terror over there. Right. Um. All right. Uh, oh yeah. So Russia now gives uh, the United. Everyone knows this story. Uh, Russia is is now giving the U.S. foreign aid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so funny that like a bunch of like. Um, you know, hardcore anti-Trumpers, uh, you know, every, you know, Trump is a puppet of Putin. They're all just, like, discrediting this, like, oh, just a PR move. Oh, come here. Like, they're, like, trying to equate this back to the, you know, the Russia collusion thing. And I'm just like, right. shut the fuck up. Just, just let the guy, like, like we let, need ventilators. Exactly, right? Let him like, give it. Let him win his PR victory. Yeah. They're not going to give him any sanction relief or anything like that. Right. Like. Your hawkish policies towards Russia will will continue. Let let the let him just be like I gave the Americans be ventilators. They still they still they still put the sanction on this. Um, nuts, so. nuts, absolutely nuts. Uh, related story: it, the it, New but York it's City's... hilarious though because the U.S. gave Russia used to give Russia foreign aid mm-hmm. back in back in the nineties when the Soviet Union fell. And now it's reversed. Finally, well, the United States <laughs> is a is a foreign welfare recipient. Mm-hmm. Finally, we reached that point. Right N- to none other than Russia, <laughs> among others, but still. <laughs> I, I love wording it like that. Yeah. Like we are a foreign aid recipient to the Russian Empire. <laughs> Related news: You know, New York City is going to run out of ventilators in six days, so I'll take the Russian ones. Well, people are like, well, the Russian ones don't work. The Italians said they didn't work. And I'm like, well, you know, they're like 20, only 20% of them work. I'm like, well, it's 20% 20 more than we had. 20% more. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If there's 500 ventilators and there's 20% of that, I'm not good at math on the fly. 100. 100. Yeah. That should have been easy. So, um, man under coronavirus lockdown in Spain tries to fool police by walking a stuffed toy dog. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that one. That's funny. Uh, I saw the one where a man tried to escape house arrest for coronavirus by wearing a ghillie suit. You know what a, a gi- ghillie suit? You know what, what is a, that? It's like you ever play like a call of duty or whatever. And you go as the sniper class and he's like in fucking leaves. He's like, he's like, looks like a bush. Oh, Jesus! So like he put a fucking bush suit on to <laughs> to like sneak out of his place. That's like a Metal Gear Solid stripe or something yep, like that. Exactly. <laughs> you might as well bust out the cardboard box and just <laughs> run around the streets that way. Yeah, why not? You, you... Imagine police like the explanation mark goes off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you probably get away with the cardboard box. That's better here in New York City, you know. Nobody's gonna... Yeah, that well, no one would think of anything. They just think you're a crazy homeless person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's hey, man, you got to respect it. Yeah, you got to respect the guy who who was walking his stuffed animal dog. It's this emotional support dog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't have that yet. Like you can go no, outside yeah, can go here outside. in New York. Yeah, like you're not gonna be shot. <laughs> You're not going to be shot upon exit. Like, I was in a park the other day. I sound like I always talk about the park where I feel like I'm a. I feel like I live in the park like a. Well, I live in the park now. Uh, but I was in the park the other day, and there's 
plenty of people like sitting next to each other and i was like oh are you sure you want to do that uh, social social distance keep your six feet do your part six feet apart ha huh? um but yeah uh i just wrote down police state snitches um i guess i meant oh yeah so police state snitches so i heard that i just heard this i didn't read an article about this confirming it yet i couldn't find one specific but um this is what i heard i heard that Police in Missouri were um, encouraging residents to uh, tell on their neighbors if they were violating social distancing. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. So is that like the new form of swatting? That's like – that's North Korea. <laughs> yeah. That's not. That's, that's North Korea. Like, Nazi tell Germany. on your na- like that's that's tell telling tell on your neighbors. Yeah, that's Nazi hey, Germany. Is your neighbor not social distancing? Go tell, go go call call the authorities. I'm pretty sure that if you did, that cops wouldn't come over. Like in New York right now, if I called up police and I was like, "Hey, my neighbor's not social distancing. He gave he was like three feet in front of me instead of the suggested six feet." Um, I think you should come and, uh, either have a talk with him or even take him away into a specific quarantine zone because he is not taking coronavirus seriously and I feel unsafe. You know, it's, uh, what's funny is that you, you say that you say that jokingly, but I can't, I can imagine that right now, uh, police, you know, uh, precincts all over New York city are probably getting tons of those kinds of calls. hundred percent. I bet they are. And they're not showing. I severely doubt that they're attending any of those calls um let's go bust this up um they don't want to do that right now they don't want to risk getting coronavirus over that shit. i've been walking around like i i've heard about like the police breaking up large gatherings but i from what i've seen and i'm near like a i'm near an epi i'm in the epicenter of an epicenter like i'm near a major hospital <laughs> yeah that has um did i did i tell you that down the street from me there is the emergency hospital yeah, no, you that did. was built. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a block uh, outside. I go outside the makeshift emergency uh, hospitals right outside my my apartment. I'm like eight blocks away from uh, an emergency center, and it was where the first uh, Brooklyn uh, person died from coronavirus. And now they're uh, last I read, they're they're overrun. So same, yeah, samezies. It's 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 crazy, but I mean, I can walk around. I don't get. Sh- there's no no one's giving me shit i've seen people who are not social distancing not getting shit from the police maybe in other areas they they are but at least where i'm at i haven't i haven't seen anything like that aggressive uh as of yet i was in the park recently and uh i just took the walk from my place to my girlfriend's and i cut through the park because it's a shortcut and it is there was like a ton of people out there like working out and shit and like you know, you got to get your exercise. I get it. But these guys are like, they're on these monkey bars doing pull ups. They were Greco Roman wrestling. Yeah. No, they were like doing pull ups and like leg lifts and stuff like that. And I'm like, good good on you for doing your fitness. But these dudes are like straight up, no, no gloves. Like they're all, there's like at least 20, 30 of these people like taking turns on the same thing. And I'm like, uh, I hope you guys have hand sanitizer. Yeah, dude, I saw the same thing. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was like, you don't want to wear gloves, right? And then people were playing handball, like ton of people yeah. playing handball, like all slapping the same ball, no gloves, you know, shirt off, <laughs> you know. When was this? Just like two days ago. Wow, I'm not seeing that level of uh, comfort up here. It's weird. It's that's more of a weird. Brooklyn thing. But it's it's stupid because Brooklyn's having a really bad problem too. Specifically, like I said, I'm eight blocks away from. You know, uh, I'm, well, Brooklyn's uh, having it, it has it worse than Manhattan, I think, yep. right now. Right? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. In, in Queen, Brooklyn and Queens are taking a, the we're, we're taking the, a beating, man. Taking the beating of it. Like Manhattan's pretty bad as well, but like that's where the real shit is going down. Like Elmhurst Hospital is like the ground zero area in Queens. Um, it's it's uh, it kind of makes you. Kind of makes you think of like a zombie apocalypse. Zombie apocalypse would be much, much scarier. Much scarier, but yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying. 
Um, I also heard a Brooklyn speakeasy was cl- speakeasy was closed. Yeah, I I don't know. Like again, why would you even want to go to one right now? You know, are you like hey, man, people, that bored people, that you want to just you, risk it? I completely understand that. Here, here's the thing, and I would have been the same way if if I was single and I was out and I was young. Mm-hmm. I would go fucking crazy in this. Like, I would go fucking nuts. Well, you know, I read that sex toy sales are on the rise right now. Uh, okay. And uh, I propose that we bring back Chatterbait. <laughs> Chatterbait? Why don't we all start using Chat Roulette yeah. more? <laughs> yep. You ever use Chat Roulette? No, I never. You know, when Chat Roulette was, like, popular, I didn't have a computer, believe it or not. So I never got to do it. Um, but I heard it was just a bunch of dicks, like literally it was dicks. One hundred percent dicks. All of you it. Know? it. It would. It would just be dick, 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 and then oh, person. Oh, never mind. He took his dick out. Dick, dick, dick. It's like dick. I totally love the idea, right? Like if it wasn't if it wasn't like ninety percent dick, like I think that's kind of cool. Ninety nine percent. dick. If it wasn't ninety nine percent dick, if it was maybe like twenty percent dick, then I would be like, all right, cool. Let's. Let's like have a random ninety second conversation with some fucking rando. That that would be cool. Hey, where are you from? Dick. I'm from Missouri. Oh, I'm from Kansas. Oh, we're right next to each other. What school did you go to? Oh, I went to University of Kansas. Oh, I went to Kansas State. Oh, wow, what a small world. Okay, next person. Oh, Dick. <laughs> dick. Um. <laughs> So that was a weird, that was, a, you can only expect that any type of um, social face sharing or webcam app is going to be polluted by uh, exhibitionist or just straight out, you know, people who get off on showing or wieners, right? The strangers or lady, or lady wieners. It's going to be subverted by that wieners, crowd immediately. You know? <laughs> Um. Ugh. Yeah. But still, like, how, could you? I, I don't understand how people could be that bored that they're like, you know what? Coronavirus doesn't sound so bad. I'm trying to get laid tonight. <laughs> you know, like, Jesus, dude. If you're if you're 23 years old, 24 years old, single, and that's how I was when I was younger. Like, I didn't. I just wanted to go out all the time and just meet chicks. That. You don't give a fuck. You're just like, I'm young. If I get Corona, who gives a shit? It'll be a funny story. That That's just how, that's how young people are. Yeah. You, you know that. That's how, that's how, that's how the people in their early twenties are. Yeah. I hear that. I would, you, I got I bet I would be able to convince you to do that. If we were both, if we were both 22, 23, 23, if we were both 23 years, years, old. years old, we had just, if we just first moved to New York and we were stuck in our apartments in Coronaville, we would be, I'd be trying to convince you to like, Hey, let's go to this speakeasy. (laughs) Return it to a new prohibition state. Yeah. It's like the 19, it's like, uh, the era of Al Capone all over again, except now it's a deadly virus. (laughs) Just stay at home and play call of duty guys. (laughs) (laughs) Just do your Fortnite, you know, uh, there's a bunch of books that you could read. Um, if you're going to read some books, I would rec. Yeah, this, we sh- this could be a whole. All right, here's the thing. This is what this is what we'll do. So I have good news. One announcement to make about bro history. I finally finished uploading all the podcasts to the YouTube channel, so we're caught up. Which means that uh, we're we're toying with the idea of doing like uh, live streaming and and things like that. Neither of us know how to work the live streaming thing. We'll figure yeah. it out. We'll figure we'll figure it out, or at the very least, to combine the live streaming with our audio recording app. Um, so we're gonna figure out the technical details. Um, I guess we're gonna be doing. I guess we'll be doing more stuff on that YouTube channel, which wouldn't that will be more. I guess kind of uh, random weird topics. So 
I guess we could, we could do a, what books you should read if you have time to type thing or I don't know what video games to play. I don't know. We'll think of something that's entertaining. Um, so yeah, check for the YouTube channel should, that should that you can subscribe to with the link in this description. And um, that's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rate and review the podcast too. Hundred percent. If you haven't rate, rate and review the show. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Stay safe out there. Stay safe. Social distance. Don't lick any poles. <laughs> don't go. Don't leave your house at all and just uh, hide underneath your bed for the next three months. That's how we're going to beat this thing.